Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who selected Israel from all the peoples and gave them your Torah to be a light to the Gentiles. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. As Simeon the priest declared after seeing the newborn Yeshua, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Luke chapter 2, verses 30 to 32. Shalom Torah Club members, this is Boaz Michael, and joining me once again is Toby Janicki as we discuss this week's parsha for Torah Club Volume 1, Unrolling the Scroll. This week's parsha is Parsha Masei, and we'll be using uh, Rabbi Plishkin once again in his work, Love Your Neighbor, You and Your Fellow Man in the Light of the Torah. Tell you, Rabbi Plishkin really has a unique perspective of the Torah. You know, it really shows. You know, the central command of the Torah is love God with your whole heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And if those are the central commands of the Torah, then every mitzvah, every verse, every word must be kind of the foundation for those principles. And I really appreciate Rabbi Plishkin's work in which he approaches the Torah from this perspective to truly find every one of those nuggets of where the idea or the principle of our actions towards humanity as being the very bedrock action required of the Torah. This week we'll be discussing two key components. We'll be looking first at a person must be careful that his actions do not lead to someone else's death. And then secondly, we'll be looking at that we are forbidden to praise a wicked person. This first one comes from Numbers chapter 35, verse 11, which states, Then you shall select for yourselves cities to be your cities of refuge, that the manslayer who has killed any person unintentionally may flee there. So let's read Rabbi Pliskin's explanation. He says, The Torah states that if someone kills another person unintentionally, he is obligated to flee to one of the six cities of refuge in the land of Israel, which were especially set aside for this purpose. The Chinuch in number 410 explains that this punishment going into exile can be equated with death. The manslayer, albeit that his actions were not intentional, has to atone for his negligence, which caused the loss of someone's life. A person must be very careful while engaging in any action that could possibly harm someone. Today, this is especially relevant when driving a car. A driver must devote himself entirely to driving, since one careless move could easily lead to a fatal accident. When you are upset or tired, do not drive. You know, it's funny because I think he wrote this book in, I don't know, the 1970s or, or, or something like that. I mean, how, how, how much more is this an issue today when people are, are, you know, texting while they're driving, you know, writing emails, you know, all the different, all the different kinds of stuff. I mean, let alone someone who's upset or tired driving a car. Mm-hmm. There are so many so distractions. many distractions yeah. and uh you know i i really appreciate the principle that he has here that we you know even when something is by accident usually it still could have been prevented you know that's why they call an accident an accident but most of the time when there's an accident a car accident there still is somebody's fault they didn't intentionally ram into the other person drive off the side of the road they did it accidentally but almost all the time, it's because of some kind of negligence, some kind of uh, error on their part where they weren't uh, fully thinking through something. The Torah speaks to this um, in, in multiple places. Uh, here's one example in Exodus chapter 21, verse 33 through 30, verse 33 through 34. If a man opens a pit or digs a pit and does not cover it over and an ox or donkey falls into it, The owner of the pit shall make restitution. He shall give money to its owner, and the dead animal shall become his. So here's a principle which doesn't really relate to a lot of our lives today, but we can derive from this and see areas in which we ourselves are opening up opportunities for people to be harmed or other people's property to be harmed. And that is, you know, if you dig a pit, put a cover on it so that it does not endanger someone else or someone else's property. Um, 
There's another verse in Leviticus chapter 19 that says that we're to remove the stumbling block before the blind. Mm -hmm. And I like taking that principle and expanding that to say that essentially anything that we are either aware of or responsible for that potentially could cause another person harm, we're to be responsible for that. So you can think of hundreds of different things in our daily life in which we're putting ourselves in a place where we could cause another person harm or, God forbid, even death. So Rabbi Plushkin mentions a, a car, and you're exactly right. If he wrote this in the 70s, and in today's world we have the cell phones, we have fast food, we're eating, we're driving, we're texting, all these type of things while we're driving, um, that's not wise. But there's other things we can do, like, for example... Um, if we walk into a supermarket or even at our own home and we realize that there's a there's a crease in the rug that's in front of the mm -hmm. door that someone may not see that they might trip over and bring them harm, you know, we have the responsibility to bend down, take the time to straighten that out, even if it's not ours, but yet we see it. So by seeing it, we become somewhat responsible for it. We own it, so to speak. There's other examples that we can talk about. Um, here's one. Um, uh, secondhand smoke. You know, in our, our world today, um, there's a lot of laws that are being um, instituted in different cities that are guarding um, people from secondhand smoke. And this is debatable. And you see people on both sides debating, you know, the freedom to participate in these type of activities. But the bottom line is that secondhand smoke does bring harm that can lead to death to innocent people that don't intend to die of lung cancer. It's most grievous to me when you see a mother in a ch with a child in the back seat smoking or the father the is windows smoking. Windows closed. Yeah. Windows closed. It, 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 you know, it's, it, you know, there clearly are consequences to our action. Mm -hmm. I mean, you think about uh, you think about pollution and littering. You know, uh, polluting polluting streams where fish live, and then people have to drink the water, and uh, you know, polluting the air quality. Uh, you know, I, I I wonder how many you know in in cities how many people with with asthma and all these kind of problems how much of it is genetic and how much of it is related to mm -hmm. really us not thinking about the consequences of, of some of the pollution things that we're doing. So essentially the Torah is telling us here that we need to be, uh, that there is ramifications for our actions that lead to people's death and also their harm, and that we need to be responsible for that. If, if we do bring, if, if we do cause something to harm someone, we take care of that and we're responsible for that. But by all means, we should avoid it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I can think of, uh, you know, this can we can almost bring this into what we talked about last week with, um, you know, the idea of we cause someone else to sin spiritually. If we are if our actions are causing someone, you know, to death, to spiritually death, we, we have to be careful, you know, not only in just a physical sense and, you know, driving our cars and stuff, but in a spiritual mm -hmm. sense. What are our actions causing other people to do? Are they causing them to think that certain behaviors are okay? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we really, really have to be careful. The second point that Rabbi Plushkin makes in this commentary is that we're forbidden to praise a wicked person. He takes this from Numbers chapter 35, verse 33, which states, You shall not pollute the land in which you are. So Plushkin writes about this. He says, this verse forbids us to flatter a wrongdoer. Flattering a wrongdoer is termed chanifus and is a very serious offense. Rabbeinu Yonah deals with the prohibition at length. Below are some essential excerpts. So he says this worst form of flattery is when a person sees that someone has transgressed and tells them, you haven't done anything wrong. Uh, it's considered this worst form of flattery to say that an evil person is a good man. And uh, failure to censor someone when you are in a position to do so is also considered a form of evil flattery. So really that goes into that whole rebuke thing. And, and, and like you said, this needs to be approached with caution. And we need to be careful, um, you know, that we're not praising wicked behavior. Um, and I think sometimes 
Boaz, you and I have talked about this in the past. What it means is maybe sometimes we just don't talk about the person at all. Don't talk about their... If we can't find something good to say and and really everything they're doing is bad, you know, maybe it's time to just kind of withhold our tongue from saying something at all. But at the same time, um, you know, he does bring out here when you're a position of authority and you have a position to rebuke this person, that you should. But, of course, this all should be done very carefully. You made the statement, or Rabbi Plushkin makes the statement, or we read from his book the quote there that said, when a person does something wrong and our response is, oh, that really wasn't that bad. But that's a form of bringing praise and flattery to a wicked person. Mm -hmm. We have to learn how to manage those awkward situations where they're maybe we're in a difficult situation, awkward situation, and they're wanting some type of affirmation that they're okay, even though their behavior is wrong. Yeah. We have to be able to manage that properly. The prophet Isaiah speaks of a time in which um, evil will be considered good and good will be considered evil. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 2 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. This is such a beautiful poetic piece that is like linking these extremes together. And and in our society, in our world today, these things do become flip-flopped. And we have to be people of discernment to be able to say, evil is bad, evil Mm -hmm. is evil, and good is good, and not to confuse these two um, or these things, and not to bring praise or even give place, which is a form of flattery, a form of praise to individuals that confuse and flip-flop these things that are evil and good. One thing that uh, Pliskin talks about here at the end, he says it's forbidden to flatter someone in order to take advantage of them. And I think about this is probably gets to be a sticky area, you know, where we're trying to, let's say, get a job or get a deal on something or or kind of get some kind of in that we would be tempted to to do what you said, to 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 flatter the person insincerely to say, oh, it's not really that bad what you're doing. And, uh, you know, it's it's funny how. When we read these things, we immediately can think clearly and we can think this is wrong. But as soon as you bring some kind of money or advantage or something, that's when things begin to get clouded and and we begin to, you know, it gets difficult. But, you know, really the Torah calls us to have that clarity of what is right and what is wrong, as the prophet Isaiah says, in every situation. So from a Torah perspective, the end does not justify the means. Mm -hmm. And as the Apostle Simon Peter admonishes us, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Master and Savior, Yeshua the Messiah. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. 